So the key to starting algebraic coding theory is to understand how we can take these problems and information in computer science and turn them into algebraic problems. The first step is going to be the following. If we have m bits of information, and we're going to read these left to right, so we have the first bit called b1, b2, all the way up to bm. Uh, if we have m bits of information, we can identify this, this, uh, the, this sequence with an m tuple. That is, you can, you can identify it with the vector b1, b2, up to bm, where we can visualize this as a vector in the vector space z2m, where you, I want you to be aware, and this is something we'll talk about some future day here. Z2 is an example of what we call a field. And you can construct a vector space by taking feet, column vectors whose scalars come from a field. Uh, and so Z2M is a vector space very much like the vector space Rn that you might have seen in a previous linear algebra course. So we're going to be doing linear algebra on this field. Now, this is the field, which only has two elements. It only contains the elements 0 and 1. Um, but in terms of the field, I want to tell you how the arithmetic is going to work here. The arithmetic is just going to work mod 2. So thinking of the Cayley tables, when you add these things together, you're going to take 0, 1, 0, 1. You get 0, 1, 1, 0. That's how addition works mod 2. In terms of multiplication, similar thing is going to happen here. 0 times anything is 0. 1 times 1 is 1. So we're going to do addition and multiplication mod 2, which to be aware, the only, the only significant difference uh, as opposed to just addition and, and multiplication of the numbers 0, 1, if we think of them as real numbers, really just comes down to this observation here. When we work mod 2, 1 plus 1 is 0, not 2, because 2 doesn't exist. I mean, it does. It's just 2 is 0 when you work mod 2. So we can do, we can do linear algebra over this arithmetic field right here. Uh, that is, we just change the arithmetic from real numbers to mod 2, and all of the stuff from linear algebra will apply. We can add uh, column vectors, we can scale them, we can multiply them by matrices, we can compute null spaces. Uh, the, the idea keeps on going there. So I'm going to make a lot of connections to linear algebra as we go through this. So with that connection to linear algebra, let's define what we mean by a code block. Uh, and in, in by m code block, which we're going to call it C, or I should say block code, excuse me, an n by m block code C. This is going to be a subset of the vector space Z2n. So notice the connection here that the first bit of the, the first number there, the n, that is going to be the dimension of this vector space Z2n. This is going to be paired. Uh, this is going to be a pair of two functions. There's the first function, which we call the encoding function. So what this is going to do, it's going to take a it's going to take a vector from Z2m. Notice this is the second number here. It's going to take a vector from Z2m, and it will identify it with a vector in Z2n. Okay? And in practice here, m will be less than or equal to n. So we are basically going to be adding more bits to the original message. So the original message is going to correspond to m, like we talked about before. The encoding process is we're going to take an m bit message and turn it into an n bit message. The reason why we do that will become more clear in the future. So there's two functions. There's the encoding function, but there's also the decoding function, which is a map from z to n to z to m. And you want to think of these things essentially as inverses of each other, right? So when you take the composite of D and E right here. So if you encode your message and then you subsequently decode the message, this will be the identity function on Z2M. So if you encode then decode a, a message, you're going to get back the original message. Okay. And then the other thing that I want you to be aware of here is that when you take the image of Z2M under the encoding map, this is equal to the set C. So that's what we mean by this, this block code right here. The code is the set of vectors in Z2N that correspond to, the, to these original vectors from Z2M. The elements of C are called the code words. So C is going to be a set of code words. Uh, and so the set is called this, it's called a code, or we can call it an N in M block code to be more specific on the parameters there. But C is the code, and the elements of it are the code words. So I want to show you this diagram here. Let me zoom out a little bit to illustrate the basic idea behind this encoding process. 
So there's gonna be over here some message that we need to send from one part of the computer to a different part of the computer. We're gonna call that original message W, W for a word. There's a word um, using only the alphabet zero and one that one computer part needs to tell another computer part. So this, it's gonna be a, a message, a word of length M. So it's in Z2M. And so before we send it, we're gonna encode it. So it goes through this encoding process. So we'll encode it. And so the word W turns into E of W, which this is a code word C, which belongs to the vector space Z to N. So we've added, we've added N minus M many bits to the message. Well, it's a little bit more sophisticated than that, but we're gonna associate a code word to the original message W. And the reason why we associate a code word to W, why don't we just send W itself? It's because of our channel right here. As we transmit the message from the sender to the receiver, we anticipate that this function T, it's kind of like a random function. It'll randomly change the number. And because it's random, it's not truly a function because the same input could actually have different outputs. But nonetheless, the transmitter will randomly change parts of the code word. And so then the transmitted code word is what is going to be received, T of C. Now, in, in general, we don't anticipate that C will equal T of C. We often anticipate there could be an error of some kind. If it were equal, that would be great. So the transmitted code word is going to come over, and then it has to be decoded right here. Um, why is there nothing there to decode it? Uh, we need to be decoding D of T of C. So that's what needs to happen. And so then what you see is the following idea. What we want is the following. We want that if you do the encoding process, then the transmission process, then the decoding process, we want this to be the identity on Z2M, okay? But the big problem really comes down to T right here. T is kind of random. Um, and so it will not be possible uh, to be for this to be perfect, perhaps because T itself is not a function, um, and so T of C is determined by chance, not by input. It's I mean it's affected by input, but it's not determined by input alone. Therefore, it's not truly a function, and so the composition of these three relationships might not be the identity function. And so what we want to then introduce is the idea of an error detecting code. So is it possible that the decoding map D uh, also equipped with E, is it possible that we can detect when E composed with T composed with D is not the identity? Can we just recognize when that does, when that happens? And the thing is, I should mention is, we have to do this on the tail end. The receiver doesn't know what the original message is, but is there a way to decode the original message so that we can detect that we don't have the right message, even if we don't know what the message is. That sounds like a very difficult problem, but turns out we will have a very nice solution to that. And even better, is it possible that we can choose the function D so that even though you have this random process T in the middle, that the composition of these things is still the identity. That is, can we correct the codes? Um, and so our goal in this unit is to, is to use group theory to develop error detecting and error correcting codes. So a K error detecting code is a code that can detect up to K many errors in transmission uh, accurately. And an L error correcting code is a code that can correctly fix up to L mistakes in transmission. So you don't actually have to ask for a retransmission. And we're gonna see how that works. Um, in this unit here. I wanna give you two examples of very simple codes to kind of show you how this could be possible, and then we will improve upon these in future lectures. So the first one I wanna mention, it's actually a very famous code, it's the ASCII code. Um, that's, that's an abbreviation, uh, acronym for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Um, the ASCII code is actually an eight, seven block code. Uh, so what that means is we are gonna encode seven bits of information using eight bits. So we have to add an extra bit of information in order to encode our message. So the significance, of course, of this is, is that two to the eighth is actually 256. And why that matters is that 256, uh, that's how many, that, that's 16 squared. 
it's 16 squared. And so ASCII, the ASCII code here is basically just two hexadecimals. Uh, so hexadecimals is a number system where you can take zero, one, two, up to nine, and then you take letters A, B, C, you know, up to F, should be F, right? Uh, I have to count these out loud now. A, B, C, D, E, F. Yep, that's 16. Um, so you so you write an, a, a hexadecimal, something like, oh, the number 20A. That, that would be acceptable right there. And so 20A, what that means is you're going to take 2 times 16 plus A, which A here would be 11. So we can convert this to the usual number system, and we could go from there. The exact details don't matter, but that's why 256 is the magic number right here. Um, that's a, that's a two-digit hexadecimal number. Okay, so we want to, so we're going to use two-digit hexadecimals to encode 128 characters. Now, the, the ASCII uh, code is going to do all of your standard letters, uh, so like A, B, C, D, uh, uppercase, lowercase. It gets most of the special keyboard characters, uh, plus maybe a few others. So we don't need to go into all the detail of that, but we have seven-bit messages, and we're going to encode them with an extra bit. How are we going to do that? Now, to give you a little bit of idea of what's going to happen here, so if you just take the alphabetic letters A, B, C, this is capital A, B, C, um, the ASCII code identifies A with the number 65, B is 66, and... C is 67. So we can think of those in hexadecimals. I'm not going to bother with that. We're going to put this as the binary expansion. So this is something we did earlier when we talked about the repeated squares algorithm in this course. So 65 can be written uh, in, in the binary as 1000001. Zero, 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 one. Um, the idea is 65, of course, is 64 plus 1. 64 is 2 to the 8th. 1 is 2 to the 0th. So you get something like that. Um, and so you get these seven bits. This can kind of be hard to read sometimes. So something you'll often see is we sometimes will put artificial spaces just to make it a little bit easier to see. So we are, we're padding the message. So 100 and then 001. We might say something like that. Um, the human eye can kind of identify up to, it basically can count up to five instantaneously. Uh, beyond that, it gets kind of difficult to count in your head. That's when you pull out your fingers and toes and such. So we often will pad uh, long sequences of uh, long binary sequences into groups of four, three, five, kind of the biggest, because that gets really difficult to to recognize six or bigger um, with the, with just the naked eye. So you might see me putting spaces in there. It's kind of the same reason why we often like write a million. Right? Why do we put like commas in there? That's because if we put them in into periods of three. Uh, it's much easier to read the number that way. We'll often do the same thing with the binaries, although I won't be putting commas. And so the associated ASCII code for the code word for A is going to be this one right here, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, okay? Uh, we do the same thing for B. Uh, B had the decimal number 66, which a binary expansion, you get this one right here, for which we're going to write the following right here. So you get 0100010. Okay. And as a hexadecimal, this would this would be what we call 41, 42, 43. Now be aware that 42 here means 4 times 16 plus 2. Okay. And this is 4 times 16 plus 3. So it's not really 42, 43, uh, but in hexadecimals, that's what we're doing right now. And so basically what happened is you'll notice here is that we're adding an extra number. We're adding an extra number to the front. Right, so A, we added the number zero in front. Um, B, we glued the number zero in front. And for C, we glued the number one in front. I'll explain in a moment why we chose those numbers in just a second. So if this is a block code, uh, an eight, seven block code, the encoding process will send a seven bit word into an eight bit code word, okay? And so what we're gonna do is the following. You have your seven bits. The last seven bits are just going to be the original bits. So B1, B2, B3, up to B7 will go unfazed. This is actually evidence that this encoding map is going to be a one-to-one, -one, which in order for DTC, or excuse me, DTE to be the identity, this does have to be, the encoding map does have to be one-to-one. -one. Okay, so we're going to see that. So the seven, last seven bits are the exact same. The first the first bit is actually going to be the sum of the seven bits we're transmitting mod two. And so this is often what one calls as like a check bit right here. This first information that's a check bit while these last ones right here are sometimes called information bits. 
So the last seven bits actually have the information we want to transmit, but we're adding an extra bit uh, to transmission uh, for, for checking. I'll show you why in a second why we do that. The decoding process is then pretty simple. Um, if you have an 8-bit message, then to create the original message, you just, you just erase the first bit. So you take the last seven bits, and that'll be then the code. Or that was the word. Uh, that's how we decode it. But in decoding also has to have built into it some idea of error detection or error correction. And so what we can see here is going to be the ASCII code is actually an error detecting code. It's a, it's a one it's going to be one error detecting. And so how do we do that as the following? So we have this parity check bit. Uh, like I said, it's the sum of all the bits. So imagine, imagine we have the following. Uh, let's take, let, uh, let, let's, let's, what do I want to say here? So, okay. So if we have a message that we want to transmit, so let's just, let's make it simple. Like we'll take one, one, one. One one one. I don't actually know what that is off the top of my head, uh, but let's say that's the one we want. That this is our original word. So to encode this, e of w is going to equal well the sum of seven. That's going to be one. So you're going to get one one one, one 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 one. That's what we're going to send, and then it's going to be sent to the other part of the computer. But let's say there was an error in transmission. So what's received? So this is our code word, right? So what's received is t of c, which turns out to be one one zero one. One 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 one. So maybe that was the error. Uh, it was in that third bit right here. Well, what's going to happen is our decoder is going to do the following. It's like, okay, I know that this first bit, the one, is going to be the sum of the other seven bits. And so if I take one plus zero plus one, that's a that's a zero. And then if you take one plus one plus one plus one, that's that's going to be four, which is also zero. Zero plus zero is zero. So oh, so the check bit. This should be this should be a zero, but it actually is a one. They don't match up. That's weird. Um, that actually means error, error, error. Our computer recognizes an error occurred, and therefore it detects the error, and then it'll request a retransmission. Great. So it detected the error using the check bit, but it's only a one uh, error detection level because what if there were two errors, right? Uh, let's say that instead our word, uh, our word TFC turned out to be one one zero zero one 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 one. In this situation. Uh, we'll see that when you add up the bits, you're going to get five, which is one mod five or one mod two. And in this situation, you're like, oh, the check bit should be one, so we're good to go. Because there were too many errors, it actually couldn't detect it. Uh, it's kind of like that situation when your mom tells you two rights don't make a wrong. Well, actually, in this situation, uh, two wrongs are detected as being right. You know, or what did I say about the mom said two rights don't make a wrong? I, I don't know if your mom said that. She probably said two wrongs don't make a right. That makes more sense. And that's what I was trying to go with here. Um, in this situation, actually, two wrongs do make a right in terms of the of the parity check. Um, and so the computer in this situation would think the message was sent, was transmitted correctly, when in fact it wasn't. And so it's just a one detection there. Let's do one more example before we sign off on this lecture right here. So this is an example of a of a error, uh, excuse me, of an error, uh, actually an error correcting code. And this is going to be called the triple repetition code. So what we're going to do is you can take a message of any length. So we're going to take an M bit message. We're going to send S or Z to M to Z to three M. That's where the triple repetition comes into play. So we're going to take the message B one. B1 up to BM, and what we're going to do is we're going to repeat it three times. So it's kind of like night lock, night lock, night lock. We just have to say it three times, and that's that's then how we transmit the message. How do you decode the process? Well, if you receive the triple repetition, just take the first time you heard it. Oh, she said night lock. Uh, okay, I heard that, and so that's how you decode it. But the decoding process also has error checking and error correcting built into it. Um, and so we're going to basically play minority report for a little bit. Uh, so the idea is we have our three pre, uh, precogs right here, which are going to give us a vision of the future, right? And so, you know, the first two, let's say, are in an agreement, but then the third one uh, is disagrees with it, right? So this is our minority report right now. Uh, and so, okay, if there's a disagreement, if there was an error, then it turns out that the more popular ch choice was probably the right choice. This was the correct choice right here. And so then we can get we can get rid of this one right here. Um, on the other hand, let's say that the second one 
disagreed from the other from the first and second or the first and third one then then we'd be like oh okay i see that there was an error in the second transmission um so we'll take the first one something like that so we can then we can't just we, we don't just detect the error we can also correct the error because we have all this extra information now this is a very simple um one error correcting code so we can accurately correct up to one error with this code. But the problem is that is a lot of extra information. We have to, we have to slow down the transmission of information by a factor of three, which is extremely slow. Um, and so do we want to retard transmission that much just to gain one level of error correction? Well, it turns out we can do much better with this in group theory, but I just wanted to kind of explain to us why we're interested in this idea of error detecting and error correction and how one actually might be able to do that using tools from group theory and linear algebra.